Hello everyone and welcome to my podcast. This is Anne P of Fiber, Floss and Fiction. Today is Monday, February 22nd, 2021. I hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, if you're a new viewer, welcome. And I hope you find a reason to come back and visit and click the subscribe button. And if you're a returning viewer, of course, welcome back. I'm glad that you've chosen to visit with me again today. Um, if you are somebody who was affected by the crazy weather in Texas, I hope things are improving for you all. I know it's probably going to be a little bit of a slow road for some of it, but um, we'll hope for potable water and maybe even heat. Um, it sounds like it's was just a nightmare. I have a lot of friends who live in Texas and it pretty much ran the gamut from folks who didn't really have much, you know, much uh, directly affecting them to folks who had no water, no heat, no way to get groceries. Yeah, just bad times. So yeah, 2021 is not living up to the hype where many things should be improved. We'll say that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. I've got a ton of stuff to show you guys and to talk about. Um, it's been, February has been a brutal month here. I, we've had heat, we've had water, so I'm grateful for those things, but this has not been a, an upbeat and improved kind of month. So let's just talk about the good stuff. Let's focus on the crafting and my books. Uh, we're going to talk about knitting, then reading, then cross-stitch, kind of like we usually do. So loads of knitting to talk about. Let's get started with that. I have um, a couple of finished objects. Let's start with the quick and easy ones. This is a little um, beanie hat that I knit. It is called Earl Grey. Um, it's from a collection of knitwear, all of which is themed on different types of tees. So I've had the pattern collection in my stash for quite some time, but I actually haven't knit anything out of it. Not sure why, because these are really cute patterns. Um, this is a worsted weight, and I knit the size medium. It's a fairly snug fitting cap. Um, it would not be good if you're trying to like wear a ponytail or if you have a lot of hair that you're trying to kind of put up in the hat because it is pretty form fitting. But I do think it's a very nice unisex hat. Um, just knit in this kind of dark charcoal gray, uh, which is Brooklyn Tweed's shelter. So the worsted weight that they carry. Give you kind of a close up of those big chunky cables. Um, this was like a night and a half in front of the TV kind of thing. It's got a nice uh, set of decreases on the top that kind of mirrors this like steamy, wisps of steam pattern. So that one's done. That will go into my charity box for later this year. Um, I also finished the second in my bow ties are cool socks. So I have a pair of those now. Again, I don't think I showed you both of these. I think I think I didn't have the second one done. Let's pretend anyway. Um, one by one ribbing here at the top and then this little textured stitch pattern that looks a little bit like bow ties. A flap heel on these and a wide toe. The colorway that I have knit these in is from Yarn Yarn Co. Uh, it's their MCN socks, so merino, cashmere, and a little bit of nylon for strength in the colorway Labra, Labra, Labradorite. I can never say that the first time out. Uh, so just a nice pair of basic textured socks. Um, women's size, but they do have an even larger size, so I think they would be completely appropriate for men. I mean, they're not anything crazy. And just enough of a textured pattern, which is just uh, knit and pearls and a slip stitch, to kind of keep your interest in them. So they 
worked nicely with this, um, which is a mm, sort of speckled pattern. It's very monochromatic, so it almost works as just a solid, but kind of denim jean color, I guess. So those are finished and I definitely enjoyed working on those and another pair of socks is always good. So let's talk about the Conway socks that I have been working on. Um, in my Willy Wonka Fibers Ravelry group, um, each month we're doing kind of like a themed knit along and the theme for February was to choose a pattern that had been in your queue for a while. Um, these are all very casual knit-alongs. There's no pressure. You can start them whenever you want. You can finish them whenever you want. You can knit pretty much any pattern, pretty much any yarn, whatever makes you happy. Um, so these are ones I'd had in my queue for a really long time. They are from a print book called Knitting on the Road by the designer Nancy Bush, who is from Utah. I actually have several of her books, which I have signed, having met her at various and sundry things in Utah over the years. And these are from an interweave book quite a while ago. Um, I think it's only available in print form. I don't think their PDFs are available. So I have sock one finished, and here's the thing about these. I love the patterns in her books. They are great, not basic basic, they're not plain vanilla. They have some interesting stitches on them. So just enough to be interesting uh, and kind of keep you moving through the sock, but definitely, you know, very wearable kind of patterns. But most of her patterns start with 72 stitches here at the cuff and do some kind of um, calf shaping and then they wind up being a little bit smaller than I personally like for how I like to wear socks from like here down and that was the case with these they started with 72 they went down to I believe it was 64 stitches which is just a little bit snug if you're doing any kind of cables which these are kind of mini cables so I think that's why they had sat in my queue for a very long time because they took some jiggering to get to work the way I wanted them to. So I adjusted the uh, cast on number to 66 stitches and I made the ribbing um, patterning match how I was going to set up the pattern on here. You'll see I've added an extra round with an extra stitch here and you can kind of also see it here and here. So I added, I think, two stitches to each half of the sock in the whole circumference to get the 66 stitches around that I liked to fit. And these do, they fit great. So I made some notes in the hopes I can match sock number two to this. Uh, this is Malabrigo Socks. Botticelli red which is just a really nice kind of rusty red darker rusty red so I have one of those done we'll work on the other one probably in March um, to finish up as a smaller project for the Harry Potter group classes um, the next thing that I cast on I have to become somebody who likes knitting blankets but I like the modular blankets and I still have my cozy memories blanket on the go which is scrap sock yarn I have gotten to the point in it where I've kind of bogged out on all the other ones because it gets to the point that just putting in any sock yarn color really drives my OCD crazy. It starts looking messy and unplanned and I really <laughs> cannot mentally deal with that, especially when things are topsy-turvy like in the rest of my life. Having that kind of chaos in my knitting is not a good match. So uh, I cast on for a, a new, new to me, 
modular blanket, which is uh, Berlin, not like the city Berlin, it's B-I-R-L-I-N-N, -N, but sounds the same, uh, which is a Kate Davies pattern. Her original calls for DK weight, but I was like, I'm gonna see what it looks like in fingering, and I think it looks really good. So here's the first of the two that I made using uh, leftover pink speckle sock yarn and edged in white. So each of the blocks will be bordered in this undyed um, off-white version. And here is the second, whoops, sorry, do that on the floor. Here is the second of those in a, another kind of springy color palette. So these eventually all get joined with a three needle bind off. So you knit them all basically together and there'll be like another um, row of the knit between each of them. So obviously they're a little bit smaller than the DK uh, weight ones that the pattern calls for. And the original pattern calls for 36 of these. So I think I will probably do something more like 42 just to make it slightly bigger. Um, but they only take about eight grams total. So like a gram of the white and six to seven grams of the, um, uh, the block color itself, which means that all of the bits and bobs I have of minis that I am hesitant to throw away would work perfectly for these. And I have a whole bunch of kind of pastel -y ones, and then I have a whole bunch of kind of more primary color ones. So I think I can probably get two blankets out of the, odd, the oddments that I have. Um, and I think that they would make great um, either charity little, little kid type blankets or um, baby gifts. It's all super wash uh, sock yarn, so they certainly could be, you know, beat up pretty well and still washed. Um, so I have two of those done and they're just one of my, like I need a little palette refresher kind of project. So working on those as well. Uh, next, I have a lot, I have a lot of knitting projects here, you guys. Um, this is a project that I'm working on for the third Quidditch match in Harry Potter. Uh, where we were tasked with finding something that was unique. And I cast on for the Orla's Vine Cowl. The designer is Karina Spencer. And this is a different kind of knitting pattern. It almost looks embroidered, but it's uh, slip stitches in three different colors on kind of a neutral base. So there's the dark green, there's the kind of terracotta and there's this lemon yellow. So I have been really enjoying this. It's not a hard pattern, but there are two rows that you have to manipulate the slip stitches over the top of the background where it just takes a little bit of concentration. It's not completely mindless. Um, the other rows are but the rows that you actually do the slip stitches are more pay attention because you, you're using several different colors and wrapping stitches twice and cabling them in some rows, but really enjoying working on this. I think this would be an interesting pattern to knit using a neutral background and then like a really bright hand paint or variegated type yarn for the, the vines. So I am knitting this, the original called for sport weight, and I didn't really have that many colors of sport weight, but I did have these three, four colors in Brooklyn Tweed's Peary, which is a fingering weight yarn, but it's plump. It's kind of rounder than many fingering uh, weight yarns and kind of squishy. So it seems to be working out great. It may be a little bit smaller in the circumference, but I'm totally okay with that. Um, and this is, I have just this, this one ball of the main color. So I'm just doing repeats until I get pretty close to being done with it. And then I'll, um, the upper edge has this same narrow rib. It's only five rounds. So 
I'll do that when I get there. So I'm just gonna keep working on this until I basically run out of the main color of yarn. So we'll hopefully have that to show you as a finished piece next time. And then I have my two other big pieces that are I'm in progress that I'm chipping away at. The first of which is my broadleaf sweater. Now this one I am kind of in the home stretch on. I'm working on the sleeves. I got the body completely knit, the front. So there's the front, which has all of that two color brioche on it. And then here's the back which is one strand of sock yarn and one strand of mohair, both of which are from Hedgehog Fibers. The blue is my hand dye. Um, it's a cash, merino cashmere nylon sock yarn in turquoise. And so I have picked up and knit sleeve one. And I have about an inch left to knit just the plain stockinette and then the cuff. So this is almost done. Um, the designer is wool and pine, and I'm really excited to get to wear this. It definitely needs a blocking, but it's getting there. So once I finish this sleeve, I'll come back and pick up stitches for this sleeve and finish that up. So that one may actually be finished next time you and I talk again. Uh, so there's that one. One more. So this is the second um, pattern that I've been working on using uh, kind of my own put together set of minis. Um, I'm doing this one for a Order of the Phoenix project for Harry Potter to pick uh, a pattern, pick a project that has lots of like candy shop bright colors in it and so i thought well that would that would be perfect for minis right because they're a whole bunch of different colors so i have pulled together a whole bunch of them and i am knitting the pattern called giddy about advent shawl which i have to tell you i am really enjoying and i may knit again um, it starts here at this tip right here and you work this way and every other uh, section is garter stitch and then a different type of lace and then garter stitch and a different type of lace. So it's like a lace sampler all at the same time that you're switching up colors. And it has kind of the center spine. So it's gonna wind up being a rectangle with two pointed ends. So there's end one and here it is coming across. And I am currently in the greens. So uh, I have with me, here's the next couple of colors. So I'm working on that bright green right now and then it'll shift to that and then the bright blue. There's 24 colors in total and I am on color number 15. So past the halfway mark, kind of not quite two thirds, but close. And it's just a mix of minis, mostly speckled eyes, a few, uh, there's one solid there so far, um, from various independent dyers that I have in my stash. So I am enjoying that one. I am enjoying using a, a bunch of little minis. I am just knitting away on that. I can get about one section done per evening. Um, and that one is also got a due date in March. So we'll, I'll be working on that and may have that one done next time I see. Maybe there'll be a whole bunch of finished things. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, okay. We've got one week of February left, so I'm mostly working on the bigger projects. A few smaller things that will be out for March to finish up the winter 2021 term of Harry Potter. Those are on tap. Um, I think that's it for knitting. Almost 20 minutes of knitting. 
let's move on we're going to talk books and reading i have a bunch of books to talk to you all about so let's get on with that Alrighty, so uh, I have fallen down a rabbit hole of various and sundry series, which is primarily what I'm reading. So I'm going to try to sort of combine some of these because they are ones that I've kind of introduced you to the authors before, and this is more in the series. So there's kind of a progression here um, and just walk you through what what has been in my reading queue. Let's start first with the books that I've been reading on Audible. Um, so I mentioned last time that I had begun the second of Elizabeth Hunter's uh, Elemental Immortals series, which are books, uh, they have a plot to them. And in this particular one, the in this series, the two main characters, Ben, who is human, uh, but the adopted child of a centuries-old vampire, and Tenzin, who is the vampire, the two of them have a partnership where they uh, have adventures looking for different types of antiquities. And so I talked about Midnight Labyrinth, which is the first in this series featuring Ben and Tenzin um last time and so had finished that one up and so i have read since then um blood apprentice which is book two in this series and follows ben and tenson um in this one they go to puerto rico and they are searching for pirate uh treasure in these underground underground limestone caves and that's kind of the adventure part of that story and i am currently reading the third full-length book in that series which is called night's reckoning where they are in the south pacific sea looking for a ninth ninth century shipwreck that contains gold um not gold glass different colors of glass uh, ingots and a legendary sword so I'm still reading book three I took a quickie break and read a novella in the series that takes place between at, at the same time as book two kind of and just before book three that tells the backstory the current story of two of the sub characters that have been in this series um, Gavin Wallace, who is a pub owner and owner of a distillery and a vampire, and Chloe Reardon, who is a longtime friend of Ben from the series, who's human and she's a dancer in New York. So I finished The Devil and the Dancer. That was just a few hours. That was a quick like weekend or read and I'm working on Night's Reckoning. Um, Night's Reckoning, there's one more book in this series after it, um, which I probably will go ahead and start because I was able to get kind of like a box set on Audible. Um, and I'm enjoying those and I kind of want to finish that story, the story arc. Uh, so fun adventure type series. There's sort of the buried treasure uh, storyline going on in them um, lots of interesting history and kind of like archaeological art history type stuff going on that is real world like real human world and then it also has this paranormal overlay with the vampire culture that's uh, a fun part of the book um, it would still be a good adventure historical like art history type book fiction uh, even without that but that's just another fun layer because there's all of the human vampire relationship dynamics and um, definitely people who think about things in very different ways okay so Elizabeth Hunter uh, I will have all the good read links down below 
Okay, so then I fell down the rabbit hole uh, of the Nevada Baylor series in Alona Andrews universe. I had read that there's a series of siblings, these three sisters, and I had read books one and two of the middle sister's history. So uh, Kim of uh, Spartan Stitcher fame had, was like, you haven't read Nevada's story, you need to go get that. So, because I, I do everything Kim tells me, <laughs> I went ahead and I got the Nevada series. Um, and there's three books in that plus a novella. So Burn For Me, White Hot, Diamond Fire are the three Nevada Baylor books, and then Wildfire is the novella. So she's the eldest daughter. Her father is dead. Her mother is retired army sharpshooter. They live in Houston. And Nevada is running the family investigative agency. She's basically a private detective. And this book series also, like most of Ilona Andrews' books, is also set in a universe where there are a group of people who have various levels of magical powers, and there are all kinds of different things, but um, the other main character in this book is Connor, aka Mad Rogan who is also known as the Scourge of Mexico. He is retired army and he is a prime, meaning he has the most power, uh, telekinetic. So everybody has a specific type of magical power if they have magic at all. And then within that, they are rated from prime down to basically average. So they're on a spectrum of how much their magical power uh, ha has strength. And so Nevada, uh, her family have um, manifest magic. Her mother does not have it. And her grandmother who lives with them, who's their main mechanic, um, she, Grandma Frida rebuilds all of their like armored tanks and uh, SUVs and stuff like that. They do not have magic. Uh, Nevada and her sisters do. And their two teenage cousins, um, Bernard and Leo, Leo, who live with Leon, who live with them and help them with the uh, detective agency, uh, they think have magic. They know for sure Bern does, they're not sure. And the first of these books, if Leon does. So again, there's the plot of what's going on, which, um, there's a mystery to be solved, an investigation to take place in each of these three books, but there's also another larger uh, storyline, backline, that Nevada gets drawn into along with Mad Rogan. And um, they're very Alona Andrews. She writes really fun characters. Her heroines are great. They're strong. They're feisty. They kick butt. They want to set boundaries for people. They don't want to be helpless, um, blushing wallflowers. They want to take charge of a situation and be strong for themselves. Um, so these are the, th the three books in the series. And then Wildfire, which is the novella, takes place after all of those three, seri three main books of the series. And it kind of introduces us to uh, Catalina, who is sister number two, and she's the one whose books I had read previously. Um, there still has to be some books on Arabella, who's the youngest sister, because uh, she's definitely an interesting character, and I don't want to give too much away for, for spoiler purposes. Um, but anyway, those were all, you know, fun, like perfect mind candy reading and I'm very sad that those series are over because they were so good. I just zipped right through them, enjoyed them thoroughly. Um, I'm also going to mention this other book I read, which is the first in a series, but I will not be reading the other books in the seri series. It is called The Blacksmith Queen by G.A. Aiken. 
So this book was on Amazon Prime Unlimited. So, you know, I got a copy to read for free. And I thought the premise was going to be really good. In concept, it is. Young adult, it's billed as young adult fantasy. The main character is the eldest daughter in this family who um, has crazy blacksmithing skills. She's someone who kind of has it as, as an art form, but it's her main passion. And um, she obviously uh, kind of channels this amazing power into and creativity into her blacksmithing. Uh, I'm not going to recommend this book because I have no idea how to categorize it, I guess. There were some parts in this book where I was like, definitely like young, young adult, where it's almost sort of Disney-ish, where she's like befriending animals and she's always cheerful and she helps everybody and she's like the best daughter ever and you know she loves her whole family unconditionally even though some of them are total jerks and then there's some parts where like literally there's enough profanity in it that I was just like wait what is the purpose of this so I'm not sure where it falls between sort of being twee and cute and Disney princessy, and then like completely foul mouthed for no apparent reason. I, I don't know. I'm not somebody who necessarily has a problem with the use of profanity as long as it has a point. But when everybody in the entire dialogue, like there's like four pages where every single sentence has some four letter word in it. I don't understand the point of it and it seems very out of character with how she's how the author has developed this main princess queen blacksmith. Uh, so just saying that I read it, not saying I would recommend it. Okay, finally, we're not actually doing too bad here. Um, I have two books that I'm on the go with. One is Night's Reckoning, which is the third in the Elizabeth Hunter series that I'm listening to on Audible. I've got, I think, two hours left to, to finish that one. And then I started another one, which is actually nonfiction for a little bit of a palate cleanser called The Map Maker's Wife, which is about uh, an exposition of, uh, expedition of French scientists in the mid 17th century to create a map of the equator as it runs through South America. So they're like in Peru and Venezuela um, and they're French, which is interesting since these are Spanish held territories at this point in time. Um, and it actually talks about this young woman who is, uh, she, she is, local nobility so she's born in Peru she's born in South America and the this group of French scientists come to her town and she winds up falling in love with one of the youngest and the I haven't quite gotten to this part but the story is about how she follows him across the continent of South America as these scientists were creating this map. So it's very interesting so far about the political situation that allowed this French group of Frenchmen to show up in Spanish territory, not be taken prisoner, not be killed. Um, their interactions with the different levels of society from kind of Spanish aristocracy down through the uh, indigenous South American, they weren't arist aristocrats, but the upper levels of that society down to the peasants and mixed caste society members um, as they're working their way across South America. So I will report back on those two next time I talk to you all. 
uh, and hopefully we'll have both of those done. I am in a reread paranormal slash fantasy slash young adult series kick right now. I haven't decided yet what the next series is going to be, but I have the Court of Thrones and Roses queued up. That one may come next. I haven't totally decided. I'm thinking I want to read the the series, A Discovery of Witches, and is it Times Convert? Whatever comes next. The Deborah Harkness uh, series. I have not read her most recent one, and that's a fairly short series, unlike the Sarah J. Moss series, which are like four and five books. Um, I'm kind of thinking I might want to reread the, Lin the Lee Bardugo series that are set in the Grisha verse because I've read some but not all of those and I could just do a whole reread of all of the all of the ones I've read and then add on the ones I have not. Um, yeah, so I haven't decided exactly where I'm going to go, but just be prepared that there probably is going to be more of those types of series as we move into March and then into April because that's what I'm in the mood to read right now and it just sounds like good escapist literature so I think that's probably where I'm going going with those once I get there okay let's move on we're going to talk cross stitch okay so let's go on and let me show you what I've been working on. Um, the first project on the list here is my Winter's Encounter. This is a full coverage piece. It is artwork by Laura Prindle. It is charted by Heaven and Earth Designs. It is the mini version of this one, but it is that artwork. I'm stitching this as I do pretty much all the full coverage pieces I've got going on a 25 count um, easy guide pre-gridded fabric. And I have been working on this page right here, which you can kind of see. Good progress on it this go round. Um, I've put about 4,600 stitches, I think, in it this year, or something like that so far. Um, mostly filled in, there's a ton of like off-white, off-gray, light gray, barely there, pinks. Um, I filled in a lot of that. I did get his muzzle finished, which I love, the detail on that, and I got most of his leg done. There's, you can see a few spots that I haven't quite completed. Um, and then I have these large tracts of um, just background to fill in. The reins are almost completed. There's some ninja stitches in there, but for the most part, they're done. So on this one, you can see right here is the bottom of this design. So I have two partial pages left to go, and then I'll pretty much be at the halfway mark. I think there's two more full pages out this way. And then a partial, that's where the corner of it is. So that's what I've got. Um, I will comment again on the fact that I feel like the detail on this one for a mini is pretty darn good. I think it, um, I think it just shows up really nicely. Yeah. So um, I, I am at the 37% mark, I believe, on this one as of now. Um, my goal for all of these for 2021 is to put 10,000 stitches into each of them. So I'm almost at the halfway point on this. I've got it earmarked for a couple of things, um, a couple of months further on. So I feel like that one is a pretty realistic goal to get taken care of um yeah so next I will be bumping up against the saddle which has a lot of detail in it and I think probably more confetti than what I've been working on but that's fine I think all that detail is awesome so I'm enjoying working on that and kind of seeing it come to life it's it's actually to the point now where it's not just background 
um, which is always a nice place to be because you feel like you're actually stitching something. Uh, next up, let's talk about the big one. This is uh, Once Upon a Fairy Tale. I am doing the supersized max color. Uh, again, this is on 25 count pre-gridded even weave. And I have been working on this section right here. This was out this weekend for the big strides weekend that we had in Full Coverage Fanatics. Let me pull that in just a little bit. You guys can see. Um, so I had been working over here in the prince's face or, you know, head over here. And I had gradually started working over here and it wasn't until I stopped and really looked at it that I realized that it is the stone walls of the castle right there. Because it's all purples. There's like no gray in there to speak of. But I think it looks very cool and it was fun to have this pop of red up here in the, the banner to work on. So that is where that one is for this go round. Um, I used this as well for our February bookshelf challenge in which we are looking at uh, romance books and I believe I used that one for like water for chocolate and then I used the winter's encounter for the other short one. Did I mark down what it was? Hang on. Um, bum, bum. Uh, no, I didn't write the other book down. The third book for this month is Outlander, which is like 8,300 stitches. I'm not going to get that one finished, but I'm okay with that because I got two of the three done, which is kind of where I've set my goal for that. So that takes me to the end of full coverage things for this month. And let me talk about what else I worked on, which is non-full coverage. This is Joan Elliott's Celtic Wheel. And I am stitching this two strands of floss over two on a 32 count even weave. Uh, the colorway is called Sampler Gold from Color and Cotton. So I had this corner done. I finished this last year and I have been working on this quadrant, which is mostly done. I have, um, I was just waiting to pull the color out when I'm coming around here because these same little brown blurbs are duplicated over here. Um, I have a little bit more left to go coming this way for the greens and the blues in here and some more back stitching. However, um, oh, and the, you can see up here, I have to repeat that motif there. The main knot work is done. The Lugnasa uh, quadrant is finished. Midsummer is finished. Most of the central braid is finished. So I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. This is my focus piece for this first quarter and I would like to get this finished next month in March. So today's the 22nd, so I have through the 28th and I'm gonna work on this the rest of the month. So through this week and into the weekend and I'm just gonna go ahead and keep going that way with the, the knot work and see if I can't, you know, kind of start bringing this, this down. The quadrant sections here uh, that are each of the sabbats are not hard to do. There's a fair amount of color change and they all have back stitching, but they're also pretty small. So they don't take a ton of time to do and I know I can get those done in one of my allotted times that I'll be working on this. I've completed 10 days in March to try to get this done. And so I feel like if I can put some good time in, it, in on it this week, I should be in good shape to get it, to get it finished. It's not really that big a piece, but um, it does, like most Joan Elliott pieces, 
it does have a fair amount of detail and you know back stitching and things like that to do on it so this is what I'm going to focus on this week I would really like to make some progress on the final bits of the Celtic knotwork and know that I'll go into March in a good spot to get this done up give you a close-up of the two detailed pieces I love how all that looks I mean she does such a great job with the color as well as the back stitching really makes stuff pop so anyway that is the goal for that and that will be what I've got on the docket for this week um, looking ahead to March which will be here in a week uh, we've got a couple of things going on in the uh, Full Coverage Fanatics Facebook book group. Um, if you're not a member and you like Full Coverage, please come join us over there. We do have monthly challenges and things to just keep you mot motivated with your stitching. Uh, so the bookshelf challenge for the month of March is going to focus on mysteries. We have three mysteries um, pulled up. And I, and I think, again, I'm going to try to do two of the three. I don't think I'm going to be able to match my project with the theme, but I am going to get the, the stitch count part done. Um, I originally was planning on working on Beloved, which is the Adele Sessler black and white piece. But we also have the March History Sprints. That event is happening for the entire month of March. And basically what this is, is Kim and I have compiled a list of uh, important dates that happened in the month of March throughout history. And for each of them, um, there's a PDF in the files section that has, you know, on this date in this particular year, this thing happened. So for instance, uh, March 1st, 1692 relates to the Salem witchcraft trials. So you have two options for that particular designated day. Um, the first is to stitch the number of stitches in the year. So 1692, 1692 stitches or you can stitch one or more stitches, but you have to match the theme, which in this case is witches. Um, and you can also do both. So what I'm gonna try to do is concentrate on two projects that fit five of the years. So I'm going with 1692 with a the theme of witches, I'm going with 1774. There's a tie-in to Galileo there. So the, the themes are celestial bodies like the sun, the stars, the moon. Um, 1903, can't remember which aviatrix thing that is, but I think it's an Amelia Earhart thing. Um, something that flies that has wings. So for those three projects, I'm going to be working on which way, because that'll cover the witch theme, obviously. Um, it has a huge full moon in it, and she has stars on her gown, so that'll cover stars and moon. And then something that flies, it has uh, bats in the sky. So those three projects will go towards those three dates. And then I'm going to pull out a stitching shelf for 1461, the theme of which uh, is flowers, flowering plants, because it's got all the climbing roses in it as well as 1457 and the theme of that is books so stitching shelf it has all the book spines in it so i'll be working on which way and i'll be working on a stitching shelf and i'll be double dipping those which you can always do in our group unless it states otherwise which is pretty much all of our challenges you can do this with um, to cover the two books i want to try to get the the number stitched for for the bookshelf challenge as well as the history sprints. Um, for the history sprints, you A, do not need to do every single project on the list. You can, but it's multiple thousands of stitches to complete in the month of March. So that may be more than you have time for. It certainly is more than I have time for. Um, and you do not have to stitch the entire set of 
stitches for the year on the single date, meaning March 1st, 1692, you do not have to stitch 1,692 stitches on March 1st. You can if you have the bandwidth to do that and the interest to do that, but you are not required to do that. The list is meant to give you a point to pick and choose from over the course of the month of March, whatever suits your stitching style and what you have time for and all of that good stuff, whatever you would like to do. Um, and it gives you the option of counting or not counting or kind of doing both, which we try to do for most of our events. Um, so that is what my current plans are for March in the world of stitching. Um, like I said, I will also have the 10 days that I want to devote towards um, Celtic Wheel, which if I can get that finished in less time, that would be fine. I will focus on other stitching projects. Um, but definitely 10 days to that, potentially, you know, 10 days each to uh, which way and uh, a stitching shelf, depending on how quickly I can get those done. Okay, I think that's it. This is going to be another long one. I'm not sure how long, but close to an hour. Doesn't seem to matter whether I do this exactly at two weeks or longer or whatever. It seems like it's about an hour. So hopefully you guys like the long ones because that's where we're going again this week. So I will be back in March to talk to you guys again. Uh, until then, stay safe, stay well. Uh, I hope things are relatively easy and quiet and allowing for some crafting time at your end. I will talk to you guys soon. Take care, y'all.